So welcome everyone to this January edition of the Uyuni Community Hours, the first edition of this year. We have a lot of topics to cover today, so let's get straight to it. So since the last Uyuni Community Hours, we already released Uyuni 2022-12, and we are about to release Uyuni 2023-01. We will see what is new on both versions. I'm also going to briefly present to you things that we are going to do for uni as part of the Hack Week 22 and briefly explain how you can join if you want to have some fun with us and help. Uh, then Jan will present changes to the content life cycle management, how to disable the mod modularity for the upstream repositories, which is something very important for Red Hat 9 and the, the different clones. Velder will present the changes to the rebooting of SUSE Linux Enterprise Micro. And finally, Michele will present the changes to the action, action chains for the Linux Enterprise Micro as well, and we will have the rest of the time for any kind of questions or ideas we want to discuss. So, news about the latest two versions, uh, versions of Uni. So, the December release. Well, first of all, we now include on the system list and on the systems more indications on the web UI, more indications about the need of a reboot for that instance. Uh, that is, uh, yeah, very interesting when you install any kind of update that requires a reboot and becomes especially important now that we are adding transactional systems such as Sli Micro, because there, we, when you, for example, install a new package, you need to reboot the system for that package to become available, but more about later. Now, the user can also select, uh, configure on, on the profile that, uh, the notifications are sent only not uh, not to the web UI using that bell icon you all know, but the notifications can, can be received via email as well. There was an update of Grafana to version 8.5.15. This does not include any new things or any breaking change, but there are several CBs that were fixed, several security vulnerabilities. So we recommend that you update as soon as possible if you didn't already. We also added some notifications about the subscription subscriptions to uh, SUSE products. Uh, I know very well that we had some problems with that because some some users reported that they were going they were getting notifications even if they were not having any products. This is going to be fixed now on 2023-01. Then for the repositories that we are generating as part of the uni server, now the change logs at the metadata are limited to 20 entries. Fear not, this doesn't mean that the packages will miss any kind of change log. This is only for the information you can get from the metadata. And this is exactly the same number of entries that uh, other SUSE products are publishing. Um, and the benefit of this is that the repository metadata will be um, smaller now. In some cases, it could be very big if one of the packages ha had a very, very long change log and it will be faster for you to refresh the metadata. And then finally, we are we were also dropping a legacy way to prevent disabling the local repositories from the bootstrap scripts. You know that when we onboard a, a unique client, then by default, all the local repositories are disabled. We had one option on the bootstrap script to handle that, that was anyway broken, but now you can do that directly from salt. So there is no need to edit the bootstrap script anymore. The documentation shows you how to create a salt state, state if I recall correctly, and uh, do it for all the systems you, uh, you onboard. Um, then, uh, sorry, let me switch to the next slide. Then for uni 2301, which is still not released, but we plan to release either today, most likely on Monday, we have three things. The first is that we did a cleanup of the release notes because they were getting really, really huge. And uh, now we only have the release notes there starting with 2021-12, which contain all the information you can still 
used to migrate from that old version. Uh, and of course, the older versions are still documented at the old release notes from, from 2020 uh, to 12 and older. Then uh, Slim Micro is not uh, a tech preview anymore. We still need to fix one back with the beacons. So you will see at the release notes that you will you will require two reboots instead of one to get the instance uh, ready. About the Slim Micro, there will be a follow-up uh, with presentations from Velder and Michele at this session of the Union Community Hours. By the way, I didn't mention, but though, for those of you that no, are not familiar with SUSE Linux Enterprise Micro, it's a transactional system. Maybe you are more familiar with uh, OpenSUSE Micro OS. Well, the concept is very much the same. And then Jan will talk about this more, but we are also introducing for the content life cycle management, the ability to disable the modularity for the upstream repositories. Again, remember that this, this is very important for Red Hat 9 and clones, such as Rocky Linux 9, Alma, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's it for the releases. So any questions so far? If not, let me briefly present what we are going to do for the Hack Week 22. For those of you that are not familiar with what the Hack Week is, this is one of the yearly events at uh, SUSE, where the SUSE employees can basically hack they, their way around anything they basically want to try, maybe not even related to the job they are performing each day, but some of us, well, we decided to invest some of this time on doing some things for Uyuni. And as you can see, the list is quite big. You can check that URL if you want to see all the topics. Probably we will even add more in the upcoming days. Remember, we have a Hack Week channel at Gitter as well, where you can join. In the past, some People from the community step up to help us. They could learn as well how to add a new operating system to Uni, for example. And I think that's a very interesting experience. But in any way, for now, Raul and myself, we are going to do what we do each year, which is testing and adding support for more operating systems. This year, we plan to try to complete the support for OpenOil, and then we will play a bit with OpenSUSE micro leap, which is basically the OpenSUSE equi equivalent of um, the SLI micro that we just discussed. And then of course, we still need to add the upcoming leap, OpenSUSE leap 15.5 and SLI 15 SP5. If I still have time, then I'm going to try to build some container images to build our unit documentation. Maybe do that on the pull request automatically. So when we submit a pull request, we can at least request that the documentation is built and published and we can check that everything is okay as expected. Dominic will work on the acceptance test suite improvements. Abit will be playing around with the support for OpenSCAP. Ricardo and Michael will work with syncing between registries, which is interesting, for example, for containers in an air gap environment. Pablo already started working last year on improvements for Uni Health Check, which is a tool to provide metrics and logs for a Uni server to show its health status and also help us understand what is wrong with when something is broken. And then Jan will try to finish his project to Unibash completion, which is a set of scripts to have completion on Bash for the Uni command line tools. And that's it regarding the Hack Week. Again, remember you can join us or maybe you can even propose some, some ideas and who knows, maybe we will consider them and we, we will try to implement them. I see some questions on the chat. Let me see, or maybe, uh, comments, yeah, no, no real questions. So before we jump into the next topic, we have some time for questions about the releases or about the Hack Week, if you want. Oh, 
well, since there, there, there aren't any questions, the, what I told before about the previous hack week, well, one of the previous hack weeks when someone from the community step, stepped in to help us. Uh, in this case, sorry, I cannot remember exactly uh, the, the GitHub or the full name of the person that helped us with us, but yeah, be aware that basically the Ubuntu 2204 support was in this case not done by me. I just completed some small pieces, but the big part of the work was done for the community. And that really helped us adding the support uh, faster to, to, to unit than only us doing it. So yeah, again, this is my invitation to, to join during this week. I will have more time than usual to help, to help anyone from the community that, that, uh, who wants to have a look. And since we don't have any other questions, then uh, the next uh, presenter will be, let me see, I think it was, um, the, yeah, Jan about the changes to CLM and Red Hat 9. So go ahead, please. Let's see if I can find how to stop sharing. Uh, yeah. Here, we, here I go. Sure, thanks, Julio. So, hello, everyone. I am Jan from SOSA Manager team. Um, let me quickly try to share my screen. Yes, that should, should be working now. So, yeah, today I'm going to talk a bit about. Um, the new uh, Red Hat 9 and flavors regarding modularity and how we handle these um, all in content lifecycle management. So <clears throat> in this in the, today, <clears throat> when I talk about Red Hat 9, um, I mean all of the flavors like Alma Linux, Rocky, uh, even Liberty Linux. So um, keep that in mind. Um, I have in my setup here, I have a mirrored Alma Linux channel. So I'm going to go on with the Alma example. Um, okay. So um, what's different in 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 nine um, compared to, to, to Red Hat 8? So um, the, struct, the, the idea is has changed a little bit. So the, the technically it's all the same, but the, but the concept is a little bit different because um, actually, using modules is not mandatory anymore in, in Red Hat 9. Um, <clears throat> let me show you what modules are available as of today in Alma Linux 9. So when I look at this page, I see only four modules. So as you might know, um, in Red Hat 8, there were 40 something, maybe even 50 modules. So where did all these modules gone? Um, so the answer is here in the package list. So for example, I don't see PostgreSQL here. Let's go with this example. Um, and I check if I have PostgreSQL in this um, channel, I see, yes, the PostgreSQL is available here, um, version 13 to be exact. And um, if you are familiar with the um, naming of the ver version naming of the packages, you can, uh, figure out that this is not a modular uh, package. This is a regular package. So that means in Red Hat 9, now um, all the older modules from Red Hat 8 are included as regular packages, not as modules. So I can still see um, four extra modules here. And what this means is that, for example, let's check Node.js. There is Node.js version 18 as a module here. And when I go to make uh, a search for this, I would see um, Node.js 18 as a modular package um, that you can make it out from the uh, release string, actually, that it has a keyword module on them, the modular packages. And we also have Node.js 16, but this one is not a modular package, it's a regular package. So um, that tells us that all the modules that were present in Red Hat 8 are now um, also regular package packages in Red Hat 9. Basically, all the default streams of all these modules are moved to be a regular package. Um, 
as you can also notice that here in this list, there are no default modules at all. So none of these uh, have default streams defined. So basically the default streams are moved to be regular packages and all the alternative streams are presented as modules. So that means if you want to use um, the default versions of all these applications, you don't need to use enable any module at all. So that means conceptually modularity is now optional in Red Hat 9. So this has a couple of consequences um, regarding CLM and SUSE manager. Um, let me try to demonstrate them. So um, let's create a new project here. Okay, let's add the sources uh, on the Linux 9. Well, screen sharing is messing up with my screen, but everything's fine so far. Okay, so um, we used to have a filter template uh, that has been added sometime last year. It's um, relatively recent, and it's called AppStream Modules with Defaults. So this was a shortcut that we could use to add um, one AppStream filter for every module that's available. It was a cumbersome work to add 40, 50 something um, filters one by one. So we added this template that helped us create one module filter for a each module um, targeting their default streams so that we could include all, all the packages from every module in the target repository. But when I try to do this on the Red Hat 9 um, project, I won't see any um, filter at all. So it will tell me that, okay, zero filters from template created successfully. Why is that? That's because there are no default modules in Red Hat 9. So this is a little bit confusing, but it's still working as in, in intended. So it just means that it doesn't make sense to use this template on a Red Hat 9 project. Um, yeah, this was one of the things, one of the consequences I uh, wanted to show. So far, there's no problems. Um, but the, the second consequence is, is actually a bit of a problem, is that um, when I want to use the, this um, distribution with all the um, default modules. So if I want to use everything as default, um, then it means I don't need to add any filter at all. But is, if, if you're using CLM with, with, with um, app streams, you definitely know that we have a a uh, very important limitation in SUSE Manager, and that is uh, we need to strip and remove the modular metadata from the target repositories if you want to use these channels with SUSE Manager. Um, so how did we do that? When you add a new um, AppStream filter, C CLM does this automatically for, for you as soon as you add one AppStream filter. But in this case, if I want to use everything with default, I, don't I, I shouldn't add any filters. So currently, I mean, up to now, this was impossible in, in SUSE Manager. So you either add a, a module filter or you, you have the modular metadata and you cannot use it with, um, you cannot do package operations in SUSE Manager. So um, the only way I could do this um, in a hacky way was just pick, um, whoops. Okay, just pick a random module that I'm not really going to use, or I don't really care. Um, let me pick Node.js 18. So when I add this to the project, then CLM will automatically remove all the module metadata for me. But then I have to use Node.js 18. So what if I really, really want to have the full distribution with all the defaults? So um, to overcome this, this problem, we added um, a new matcher here for this module stream filter. So as you can see it now, um, in addition to the equals matcher, we have non matcher. So when you when I choose this one, uh, one second, let's do it properly. All this disable modularity, uh, and I. When I choose none, um, it doesn't ask me anything else. So this is all this filter does. So uh, when I choose none and save, that will mean that now the module metadata is, is going to be stripped away, 
but I didn't specify any module. So everything will be as uh, on their default version. So you can also see this um, from this information message. It says modularity is disabled. No modules will be included in the target repository. So this is a way um, to be able to create regular repo targets um, without the module, module metadata, without having to specify any module or any specific uh, different version than the default. Um, if you, for example, try to use this filter together with um, some other module filter, let's see, I disabled modularity and at the same time I want to add something else. This is not possible and this uh, UI will tell you that um, modularity is currently disabled. So you have to disable um, this first filter that we have. So you, you cannot use them together. Um, yeah, so basically this is how we do it now. So if you have, have a Red Hat 9 um, project and you don't really want to specify any, any different, um, any of the modules other than their default versions, then you don't have to add any modules here at all. So you just need to use this one and go ahead and build your project and you will have a regular repository with all the default versions um, in it. Um, yeah, that's basically it. So I think now I can get some questions. There is one on the chats. They are asking, what about the case where you only want the Node.js 18 filter? Will it remove the module, the module packages from the other not defined module streams? Uh, yeah, good question. Not really. I mean, as I said, all the default versions are regular packages anyway. So they're always in the repository. Um, the only time we remove one of those packages from the target is when you select Node.js 18 explicitly, then we remove Node.js 16. Other than that, all the defaults are always there. You need to explicitly remove that. If, if, if for example, if you really don't want one of those module packages defaults, then you need to create a different filter here, a package filter, because they're regular packages. Okay, next one I'm reading from the chat. Um, if now the modules are optional on Red Hat 9, do we need to still use CLMIT with Red Hat 9? Yes, actually, that's right. Because um, even though it's op optional, the module metadata is still there and alternative major versions of those applications are still there and that, that will still confuse the manager. So we still need to go through the CLMA and at the minimum, <clears throat> sorry, at the minimum, we need to add this um, um, this new filter to disable modularity. Um, the typical warning is still there, unfortunately, just because of the reason that I mentioned. Um, so in in essence, in this in in Red Hat nine distributions. Um, any application that has a module um, has multiple major versions in the distribution available. So DNF and the modularity um, gives you a limited projection of the distribution so you, that the client see only one major version um, in, from, the, from the whole um, channel pool. But SUSE Manager doesn't recognize that. So SUSE Manager sees all the diff all the major versions at the same time. So if you're using um, a lower ma major version, which which is maybe the default, so the manager still thinks, for example, Node.js 18 is an upgrade to Node.js 16. That makes sense from SUSE Manager's um, side. So um, to to prevent this from happening, we need to remove this modularity. So that's why we are going to CLMA. Um, yeah, I guess that would explain. Uh, Answer this. Um, any other questions? Seems no questions, but I told a lot of yeah, a long conversation at the the chat. Yeah, telling that this is indeed very very useful. Maybe it can be improved more, but for another situation, is way 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 better way better than it used to be. So yeah, very nice.
and as well. Well, hopefully, yeah. Um, before before I I hand over to you, Julio, let me let me a little bit uh, tell you a little bit about what's next. What's what are we gonna do next um, about Red Hat and upstreams and everything? So the next thing we are working on is also a really um, cool addition that was um, that originated from from the um, from the people in the community actually, and that is um, we want to. Um, create or assemble a, a, an arbitrary new module metadata for the target repositories. So as you know, now we strip away the module metadata and pr uh, present uh, the targets as regular repositories. This works, but DNF is not super happy with that. Like it's a, it's a, from the client perspective, it's a little bit of a hacky way to do this. So um, we are, we have modular packages, but there's no modern metadata. So DNF treats them as regular packages, et cetera. Now what we want to do is, um, so the workflow is going to be the same. We are going to use the CLM, pick our, pick our modules and pick one stream per module or no streams at all. Like then we will have the defaults, of course. And then when we build this CLM project, we want to write a new module metadata that includes only the selections we have. So in the end, DNF and the clients will have a, a module metadata that's written by us, which is a subset of the original module metadata with only one stream per module. And then this will um, this will satisfy DNF a lot more. So then you could still use the module commands of the DNF. Of course, you will only see one stream, um, but still this will um, help um, overcome a lot of the confusion and some potential problems. That is the next thing we are going to work in the upcoming months. Um, and yeah, actually that's that's um, what's upcoming. You can you can expect more news in the, um, about that in the upcoming months. And with that, I think I am done. So thank you very much. And I hand over back to you, Julia. Thank you very much. And uh, the next presenter is going to be Velda talking about the rebooting of SUSE Linux Enterprise Micro. Go ahead, please. Okay. Hello, everyone. I will share my screen. Okay, I guess you can see my screen. I am Welder and I will talk a little bit about rebooting SUSE Linux Enterprise Micro, SLE Micro. Uh, let's start with a little bit of background on this. Um, transactional systems uh, like SLE Micro uh, use transaction update to perform management actions. So the root file system is read only so each time you need to install a package or a patch, apply a patch, perform an update, you typically use transactional update command to run this is kind of action. And when you run transaction update, um, a new read write snapshot is created from, from the current file system or even for a snapshot that you can specify. And then the changes are applied. You install the package or apply the patches in a way. Uh, and then the snapshot is switched back to read only mode. But this new snapshot created after applying the changes will be active only after you reboot your system. So, uh, if you are managing a transactional system using Uyuni, it's, uh, it's essential to know when a reboot is necessary because otherwise the system can keep running the old snapshot without the changes really uh, applied, really booted. So this is, a, this is a specific problem for transactional systems we are approaching. And additionally, uh, Uyuni typically uses system reboot salt module to, to perform the reboot actions, uh, which means shoot down dash R to perform the reboot. 
but uh, rebooting transactional systems using this module may not be safe in some scenarios where uh, because transactional update uh, can be used to perform the reboot and transactional system has its own configuration regarding reboot method, how the how and when the reboot should be performed. So we, uh, although you can run reboot in a transactional system, uh, it's safer using it through transactional update. So the reboot method configured will be use it as expected and so this is also a problem we are approaching in, the, in this new version uh, we are approaching the south model module used to reboot transactional systems um, then we are providing two improvement two big improvements regarding rebooting transactional systems we are properly properly handling the reboot action itself. I just solved the problem I just described. And we are also reading from transactional systems when a reboot is necessary and keeping this information up to date in this Uyuni server to properly report in the UI when a reboot is required for a system. I will detail these two improvements right now. Uh, the reboot action, it's kind of an internal change. We now are, are using transaction update.reboot module to perform the reboot action. Uh, switching to use this module, module can introduce a problem if you don't change the, re the default reboot method because if you use transaction update reboot, it will not typically uh, reboot immediately as it should be necessary if you are uh, managing the system through Uyuni. So to solve this problem, when bootstrapping a transactional system like SLE Micro, we are changing the, the, the reboot method configured in that system to system D. That's one of the options that is available and changing to system D allows you to perform the reboot immediately for transactional system, then we can have control of the reboot at all. So, but we only change the reboot method if the system is in its default configuration. If for some reason you have a transactional system and you change the reboot method before bootstrapping it on SUSU Manager, or Uyuni, we keep the, the reboot method uh, as it is, but it's not recommended to use an other reboot method because we don't know if Uyuni will be able to perform the reboot as, expect, as expected. So it can lead to undesired behavior. And to the other solution I mentioned, we created a salt beacon uh, that runs a salt module, this one transactional update pending transaction. It, it runs every 10 seconds in transactional systems to check if the status of pending transactions changed from the last run. It means that if you bootstrap a new system, no reboot is required, no transaction is pending, there is no transaction pending, but if you install a package, for example, then this status changes, there is a pending transaction, the beacon detects this change and notify the master that uh, the status for reboot changed for that menu. In that case, it will require a reboot. But also when a reboot is required, if you perform the reboot itself, it changes again before it was, there was a, a pending transaction because you installed the package. And now after the reboot, there is no pending transaction anymore. So the change is detected and the master is notified that no reboot is necessary for the system anymore. So uh, I can, I have a transactional system here to, to share this, the behavior I just described. I will share another screen, just a second. Uh, 
Um, I hope you are seeing a uni installation. And we have a SLE microsystem here that has some packages and patch updates necessary to be installed. And once we install a package, I will select any package here just to check. I will upgrade this package and I just, as I just explained it, it will create a new snapshot that will be only active when the system is rebooted. So once this action is finished, a reboot will be necessary for this system and the Wii server should be notified about it by the menu. It should not take long. Yes, the package is installed and the master was notified now. It can take up to 10 seconds to be notified. And this warning is shown at the top. There is a pending transaction for this system. Please reboot it to activate the changes. And then you can go and reboot the system. If you update here. And once you reboot the system, the, once the reboot is finished, the, this warning message should be gone from here. Uh, the reboot should take some time to happen, uh, but until we wait for it, it's all for my presentation and uh, we can open for some questions maybe if you have so any question yes thank you welder for your work on this um so the as you said the transactional update reboot um is not actually what we're calling yet in uni right or or is it? Because initially, I know if you go to system details and schedule a system reboot, it was doing that outside of transactional update. But it did, if you schedule it in an action chain, it was using transactional update to schedule a reboot. Is that still true? Or have we changed that? We change it now and then for, for the next version. Uh, both uh, reboot actions inside action chains are just an, uh, an, a regular reboot action. We will use the transactional reboot module. OK, great. Thanks. So the reboot action finished, and the banner in the top is gone. We cannot see it anymore. This is because the the beacon i just explained how it works and that's it thank don thank you don for the question and more question yes i see one on the chat so the question is so this has required changes to uni and coming with 202301 due next week Yes, that's the that's the case. All the things that Velder just presented will be part of 2023-01. Okay, yeah, I think this was in, indeed a very important presentation because understanding how the reboot works is, in my opinion, critical for understanding how to manage the transactional systems. 
it's a different context, uh, context different way of working. Uh, well, this is just a personal opinion, but I'm using this for some continuous integration for several years already. And uh, this for the, that kind of thing is, is amazing because in the end, one of the benefits you get is that if any of the packages, patches you are installing are causing a problem could be, you know, this situation very rare, but happens from time to time that you install an update and then the system is just not booting for whatever reason. Then with the snapshots, you can just safely roll back to the to the first one. In fact, I'm not sure how Steam Micro is doing it for uh, open source micros. This is basically working automatically. And uh, yeah, you don't have that system broken for for a lot of time. So yeah, pay attention to, to this presentation from Belder. Thank you very much, Belder. Thank you. So it's back to you, Julio. Okay, and then our last presenter is going to be Michele talking again about SUSE Linux Enterprise Micro, but this time about action chains. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Okay, let me share the screen now. Okay, can you see the screen right? Yes. Okay, yeah, I, I think we still have the, this, the limitation about the, the reboot on the action chain, but uh, yeah, let, let's go ahead and uh, I'll explain the, the changes uh, required for Sli Micro. So, okay, first of all, just a, a, a brief introduction about how the action chain works. Uh, what happens is that uh, all the action that are scheduled are converted uh, in, a, in a state file. Uh, so as you, as the one, you can you can see in the slide. Uh, so, for example, this this action perform um, a, a, the installation of a package uh, as a first action, uh, and then uh, and then a reboot. In this way, uh, we are we are sure that the action chain uh, it is executed in the in the in the correct order. So, um, what happens, for example, uh, the, the main example is when a reboot uh, is performed. So, what happens when it, in the action chain, there's uh, the reboot. Um, a, a reboot is scheduled at the end of the state file, uh, and then uh, it's generated uh, a file uh, called uh, manageractionchain.conf uh, that contains uh, all the information for restore the uh, the seed for restore the action chain after after the reboot. Uh, so, for example, if we have uh, this wonderful action chain with the reboot, uh, what would happen uh, is that. Uh, uh, the first action is the installation, uh, then uh, the action for the, the reboot, uh, uh, it's always in the state file, uh, and then uh, this file contains uh, contains uh, uh, the information to restore the, the action chain, uh, it's always present in the, in the state file. The content is something that uh, looks like uh, this file, so basically the action chain retrieves the information about the next chunk, so when everything is, is rescheduled, uh, the action chain will look for this new file uh, and it's able to recover to recover everything. So, okay, if you are now wondering why it's not this, this have, might have problem with the Zlimaco, it's because uh, uh, this action is are executed uh, as as a state in a traditional a traditional salt minion. Uh, but uh, if you are a transactional update system context, uh, what we have that uh, all these actions are executed uh, inside uh, a, a snapshot. So there are some action uh, like the reboot, for example, that cannot be executed inside uh, a, snap a snapshot. This is because uh, uh, for the nature of the transactional update, uh, uh, everything uh, it's all the commands are run inside uh, a ch root, uh, so it's not possible to to run a reboot in that context. So what uh, uh, we try to um, work around about um, on the on this problem. So how it's working now is that uh, the reboot action is removed completed from the from the state file, and uh, some new argument are added if a reboot is required. Uh, basically, these actions are called um, next clean and are. Are some are some information for the action chain to understand how how retrieve the the behavior after a, a reboot, and uh, yeah, in general, since um, it's not possible to schedule a, a reboot inside the snapshot, uh, what we do it's uh, uh, use this trick. Uh, so instead of 
having a boot, uh, we will just uh, uh, activate the transaction. Uh, activate a transaction means that uh, if there is any any action that performs some changes in the in the file system, uh, the the, um, the system is rebooted at the end. So this is uh, uh, an example. Here you can find you can see uh, two uh, two exchange chain uh, doing the same the same things. So installing a package and reboot. Uh, but here you can find uh, you can see the difference between what happens in the no transaction update system and transaction update um, minion. So as we saw before, at the end of the no transaction update minion, there's a reboot. Uh, instead, in this case, uh, there's this uh, new action new function called. Uh, Manage an action clean uh, that uh, explain to the action chain uh, once everything is recovered. Uh, okay, you shouldn't do anything else in the action chain. Uh, you can you can clean the environment. Uh, and here, yeah, what what you explained you uh, before. So uh, the reboot required uh, is passed uh, as as an argument to the uh, transactional update configuration. Uh, so if a reboot is required, uh, uh, we just activate this uh, transaction. So. This behavior has some limitation, as you can as you can understand. So, uh, as explained, the reboot is performed just uh, if there is if there are any changes in the snapshot. So, if you store a package and then you have a reboot, uh, okay, this is the changes in the snapshot. Uh, so, the the, um, the reboot is performed, but if you have uh, any other type of action, so a remote command that does not have any change in the snapshot, uh, and then you try to um, schedule a reboot, uh, this one will not be performed. Okay, same logic, uh, quite similar. So if you have, uh, if you create uh, a salt remote command uh, with uh, uh, with a reboot inside the script, uh, um, in that case, uh, it will not work. And the reason is why the script that you just created uh, to be run inside the transaction, uh, inside the snapshot, inside the transaction, and uh, inside the transaction, uh, the, reboot, uh, the reboot action uh, would fail. And uh, okay, similar to the, um, yeah, as I said, as explained, uh, similar, just remind always that uh, all the actions that are uh, in the in action chain are performed inside the snapshot. So if you are doing uh, an installation and after that you are trying to use uh, directly what you already installed, uh, it, it, it will not work. You need, a, you need a reboot because you need to perform, uh, you, you need to use the, the use snapshot that you have been created. Okay, and that's all for my side. I don't know if there is, if there are any questions. This is really good. Um, and obviously, just like I think we've answer answered a lot in the chat, that when we say we're doing it for Sleep Micro now, it, as Michele pointed out, it's really about doing it for transactional update systems. So it, it will definitely carry forward for Leap Micro and also in future for ALP-based solutions. So this is a, a forward-looking thing for, for strategically uh, for us to be able to align with those type of product. Uh, and any testing that you do, if you find uh, challenges in the process, please let us know. There's some really good uh, documentation inside the SLE micro docs on transactional updates that might be worth linking or reading uh, for any of you who are unfamiliar with that. Yeah, Donald's absolutely right about the vision because, in, in fact, the work that the rest of the developers did will basically, yeah, <laughs> be maybe 90% of the work that we would need to, to add support for OpenSUSE uh, Leap Micro. So what I expect for, the, as I mentioned before, that's something of the, of the things that uh, Raul and myself want to do. I expect that it should be as simple as adding maybe bootstrap repositories, some salt definitions here and there, maybe some small Java changes to identify the products and boom, things should be working or at least most things should be working. So what I'm telling with this is if someone from the community feels adventurous enough to give, to give it a try to open source a leap micro 
now that's something you could do. It's yeah, not supported, but you can still tell us how it's working by us adding the, in the case of, uh, yeah, well, the OpenSUSE LibMicro 15.4, well, add the 15.4 OpenSUSE client tools there and things that are working for this LibMicro should at least on paper be already be working for OpenSUSE LibMicro. Just wait until 2023.01 before you start your testing though. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, of course. I wait until Monday <laughs> until we release this. Yes, that's a very good point indeed. And then after that, well, it's one of the ways you can help us with the, with the half week. Otherwise, my expectation, this is not a promise in any way, but my expectation is that you should get the support ready for Leap Micro um, 15.4 maybe on unit 2023 02 something along those lines worst worst case maybe as a tech preview so we can get more feedback so yeah stay tuned and we will see and uh, with that if there are no more questions about this topic then we still have as always seven well in this case seven minutes to any other questions about any other topic you may think or any suggestions, something wild that you want to discuss, something that you want to propose for the next sessions. So just talk or write on the chat. I was just wondering whether there are news regarding the Ansible playbook support in the uni. Do we have a bit here? Yeah. Uh, Christian, maybe you want to expand your question. Uh, like, as far as I know, we do have this basic playbook support in uni. Yes, correct. Um, I'm just looking for the issues. I created two issues on the GitHub. So mm -hmm. the first of all was I suggested in January last year that some of my customers requested an Ansible customization UI. So like for the salt stack formulas where you can select formulas and select some values, customers would be interested in seeing the same for Ansible. And so for example, you could drag and drop Ansible mm -hmm. roles and uh, maybe um, select some values for that roles. And by pressing the button, you could um, execute that code using the current implementation. That would be the first thing. I will link the issues to the chat. And recently I suggested having an option for seeing the whole output of the Ansible playbook command. Because currently yes. you only mm -hmm. see that salt actually ran the Ansible playbook you selected from the UI, but you don't see which things have been changed, which things failed, et cetera, et cetera. No, oh, I, I, yeah, I get your point. So overall, Ansible is definitely on our roadmap, not in immediate, uh, but we do expect to improve it as we will move further uh, with ALP progress. So the, uh, we do expect that there will be quite much content uh, when it comes to ALP. And uh, this is one of the things that is definitely on our roadmap and we will be improving. And we still haven't come up with the roadmap how we, uh, uh, how or what we are going to improve in Ansible, but there are a couple of things and we will definitely be keeping these two points that you mentioned in the uni. And uh, we will definitely be in, uh, be in touch as well with the community to see that yeah, what we could improve. Um, there are already, uh, uh, as I mentioned, there are some plans. Uh, we haven't been, uh, uh, we haven't gone through in detail, so I can't say much, but uh, Ansible isn't something that we have forgotten, and we definitely plan to improve the support in Uni. Okay, great to hear. Cool. Um, one thing um, that I, I'm pretty sure you're going to see maybe next time, but soon certainly, is Uyuni running in a single system container on a dedicated Podman container host. Oh, um, that's good. Yeah, Ricardo and I have been uh, doing, he did 
the first wave of work and we've been working together on doing this and I successfully started containerized Uyuni on Rocky Linux 8 and Ubuntu 2022.04. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, a, it's a hopeful thing for us starting to uh, containerize it. It's not the end of the road. It's actually the beginning of the road toward containerizing the server, but it might make it so then, then our community can be broadened to people who do not natively run OpenSUSE. So mm -hmm. I think it will be it will be fun to show and uh, it, it's going to work. So I, I could I could tell you right now it's going to work. So I've been we've been messing around with it, but hopefully we'll show you soon. That sounds great. So the next step would be having a Helm chart, which deploys all the dedicated uni services, such as the database, et cetera, on particular pods. <laughs> but having right, a single Right, right. Instance... Well, OK, so yeah, actually, uh, Helm chart is uh, down the road a little ways. I, can't I think imagine. what's going to happen is you will, you know, the first part is to get the whole thing running. And obviously, we're doing storage mapping and things like that. But uh, secondarily, we'll. Um, be running uh, some of the components in their own separate pods uh, as we work our way through the function of the the entire server. So there's a it's a long roadmap. Uh, we're not due to deliver it on the SUSE manager side until mid 2024. So we've got a little bit of time to be uh, uh, working things, and as we go, uh, just trying to clean up code and and make it uh, take advantage of some of the cloud native functionalities uh, beyond just uh, convenience of startup, uh, but to do more things with scalability and uh, individual module scalability and and pulling things out into their own separate containers will be part of that. But yeah. It's coming. It's on the way. But yeah, you're right. It will. Eventually, the whole the idea is that you could run it on top of Kubernetes and gain all the the great advantages of of that type of uh, scalable platform. Uh, we're not quite ready for that just yet. <laughs> it's uh, the single container right now is in excess of two gig, so it's not small, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it does run. I will say That's it good. does run. That's a good MVP to uh, start with. I have another question. I also submitted it to the issue board on February two years ago. Um, I was just wondering whether um, thin provision repositories are also part of the roadmap. I don't know whether you are fami familiar with the Catello uh, project that Red Hat is using to craft Red Hat Satellite. They have a download policy called On Demand, where it only gets the metadata of YAM, Sibir, and app repositories. And when the first client actually requests the file, then it's downloaded. So this saves a lot of disk space. And of course, it reduces time dramatically needed for system provisioning. Uh, it's it's not something that is on our roadmap. Uh, about yeah, we will see. And about the roadmap itself, uh, uh, Stefan also asked this question. So we do plan to present uh, a roadmap to the community, uh, hopefully with the next community hours. Uh, that will include uh, like uh, that will be uh, we will be looking overall the picture what we are going to do uh, over the next year, and if you would be interested in the containerization roadmap like what we are planning to do for that particular topic, but because that one is the big one, uh, we could also have something around that uh, about this year. Uh, has, I'm just repeating myself about this Catello thing. Uh, no, this isn't something that is on our roadmap currently. Okay. But that said, I mean, it certainly is a, a, va a valid point, uh, uh, reducing the time to deploy, reducing the size of our spacewalk, for example. Um, I mean, I have a SUSE manager server that I manage where my VAR spacewalk is 2.3 terabytes right now. <laughs> wow. And, okay, and that's, that's just not, 
it's not super tenable, uh, generally speaking. I mean, obviously that includes almost every channel that Seuss Manager supports, but but nonetheless, yeah, totally get your point. And, and yes, that's been discussed quite a bit. Great to hear. Okay, and it's five, two already. Uh, of course, we could still have some other questions. I see one hand raised. Let me see. Alex, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, not a question. I just wanted to say I will be at Boston next week on the weekend. And I don't know if anyone who is in the call will also go there. We have someone else from our team also coming. Um, but maybe we can organize a meetup um, using the um, Gitter chats that we have if you are there. So, um, I will also post it in Gitter again. Just want to, to announce that. Yeah, sure. I see some people already mentioning that will they will be there at the at the chat. So that will be awesome. Okay, then if we don't have anything else for now, then as always, thank you everyone for joining, for presenting, for making questions for this session of the UNI community hours. Remember that I will see you within one month first Friday of the month, but meanwhile, you can still stay in touch using the mailing list, Gitter, the GitHub issues, and of course, we hope you will enjoy the upcoming release of 2023-01, hopefully on Monday. So thanks everyone for attending and see you next time. Have a nice weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Have a nice weekend. Highly appreciate it. Bye. Bye. Have a Bye. lot of fun. See ya. Bye-bye. Ciao.